Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today at the AWS Healthcare and Life Sciences event. We are so delighted to be with you today to talk to you about TetraScience. TetraScience is an R&D data cloud platform that unifies R&D data in the cloud. Um, we work with biopharma companies around the world to make their data truly accessible and actionable. My name is Rachel Darasek. I'm the Vice President of Marketing at TetraScience, and I'm here with my colleague, Punya Biswal, who's the Chief Technology Officer. And we are so delighted to be with you today to share our story. So our talk has three parts. We're gonna talk about the Biopharma Digital Lab data landscape specifically. I'm sure everyone in this room, in attending with us today will not be surprised to hear that this data landscape is siloed and fragmented. Um, and then Punya is going to talk about the TetraScience platform and how our platform provi provides the hub that unifies this digital lab data, of course, based on AWS. And then we'll go through a case study about uh, how we worked with some innovators at Biogen using our platform in the real world. So when we think about this fragmented siloed landscape in the life sciences, we distill the R&D lab down to two, two items, data sources and data targets. The data sources produce the data. This is where the scientists and third-party collaborators use instruments um, to run the experiments and collect all of the data needed to uh, discover and develop new, new therapeutics. So there are tons of different types of instruments, tens of manufacturers, uh, hundreds of instruments. The new types of instruments makes models, software, getting updated regularly. Uh, so there are, there, there are a lot of different ways to generate data. And as I mentioned, increasingly, there's a trend towards third-party collabor collaborators called CROs, contract research organizations, uh, where a lot of these experiments are often outsourced to these third parties. On the data target side of the equation, this is where the data is consumed. So there's also a very busy landscape on this side of the equation. There is a virtual alphabet soup of software platforms, ELNs I'll call out, call out specifically because that will come up throughout the presentation, electronic lab notebooks. There's also LIMS and SCMS um, that cover uh, sample management and process and document management, respectively. There are data warehouses for archiving. There are uh, the new data visualization and data science tools like Tableau. And this side of the equation is also becoming more and more fragmented and siloed. So this siloed fragmented landscape results in uh, pharma R&D labs experiencing all the usual big data challenges that most of us are familiar with. Uh, the data sources, forget about talking to the data targets, they often don't even talk to each other. And when a scientist needs to conduct an, exper an experiment, often they need to use more than one instrument to conduct that experiment. So the data needs to flow from one instrument to another. A couple of those data points likely need to go to the ELN so that they can do their immediate analysis and figure out what experiment to do next. But the complete data set probably needs to go to a data archive. And then the data scientists are left trying to access all of the data any way they can. Um, usually once the data goes into an ELN or an archive, it does not come back out again. So as I've described, this landscape is highly siloed. It results in lots of manual processes and transcription by the scientists, which means that it's prone to error because humans are processing and transcribing data. There are heterogeneous formats because of all the different players, and none of the players are incentivized to share data or make it easy for data to flow from one place to another. And this all results in the data not being accessible and not being reusable, which is not good for any of us because it severely impacts how quickly we can discover and develop new therapeutics. So what are companies doing about it today? Well, from what we can tell, most companies are either building custom solutions in-house or they're hiring a, a consulting company to do it for them. Either way, it is not scalable and not efficient. 
think about it. If you have 10 data sources and 10 data targets, and I can assure you there are far more than 10 data sources and far more than 10 data targets, you would need to manage 100 integrations in order to be sure that everything integrated with each other. That is a lot of work. And there's just no need for it. Um, none of the, very few of these vendors are going to take it upon themselves to integrate with each other without this manual custom point-to-point -point integration. So it's going to take a third-party neutral partner like TetraScience Tetra that focuses first on the data. Um, our only focus is on the data and making sure that we are connecting all of the sources with all of the targets so that the data can flow freely from one place to another. And scientists and pharmaceutical and biotech companies ultimately can have the data they need in the place they want it with the right format so that they can unlock the power of AI and data science. And this approach solves all of those big data challenges. Um, it automates the data collection, it centralizes everything in the cloud, of course, based on AWS in our case. It harmonizes it. And all of this means that your data is now prepared for data science and advanced analytics. A lot of folks out there who talk about this problem really focus on the first two of these big data challenges, the automation and the centralization, which are probably the most acute pain points right now, but they only get you part way there. They only solve part of the problem. It's like, um, I have two small children at home. So when we have guests over, uh, we are often scrambling to clean up the house quickly before the guests arrive. And we might take that mess and shove it in the closet and close the door. Well, you can't see the mess. We've now centralized the mess, but the mess is still there. It's still a mess. It's just centralized in one location. If you don't actually take the time to clean up the mess, harmonize it, to put things in the place that where they're supposed to be, it's never gonna actually be cleaned up and ready for use again. So in case I haven't yet convinced you that this is a major problem that can only be solved by a neutral partner, let's think about uh, some of the, the numbers associated with this problem. So we did some quick back of the envelope uh, calculations. And if you go ahead and assume that a big pharma company has 1,500 scientists that they're paying $125 per hour and that they spend 15 hours per week doing this manual data wrangling the processing, the movement, the transcription, the analysis, that pretty quickly adds up to a million hours and $125 million spent in scientists doing data wrangling instead of actually doing their experiments. And this is a, a very, very back of the envelope calculation. It does not include a lot of things like the cost of data errors or the inability to reproduce experimental results and what that might cost you. So what I'd like to know is, what could your scientists do with a million more productive hours in a year? What about your data scientists? What could they do with accessible, clean data at their fingertips? Well, I would really like to find out, and that's what Tetra Science is here to do. So with that, I will turn it over to Punya, who is going to tell you a whole lot more about the platform itself. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, that's a that's a super exciting charge uh, uh, to, to give us as the software team. How can we enable these scientists and these data scientists, uh, these highly specialized, precious members of our society, to be really much more productive with the time at their at their hands? Um, and uh, you know, I, I'm excited to show you how we have built software, you know, leveraging the power of AWS to move that mission forward. So. Uh, uh, if we could move forward. Uh, just to quickly recap what Rachel said, we think of the lab as consisting of data producers and data consumers. Sources might include uh, lab instruments of varying sophistication, going all the way from your uh, mass balance, all the way to a uh, an HPLC, you know, sophisticated instrument with a, a supporting data system, a, a Windows computer attached to the instrument, or it could be something outside the lab, like a contract research organization. Um, the first step in what Tetra Science does is to deeply understand the data formats coming out of each of these sources. And we build data connectors 
that engage with these sources, pull the data from them, and then send them into the cloud, into the data lake, right? Uh, the data lake is where the data gets, as Rachel said, centralized, but not yet harmonized. And that's the next step. We have a set of data pipelines that operate on data that's been ingested into the cloud, into the data lake, convert them into a standardized data format, the intermediate data schema that I'll talk more about later. And finally, given that the data has been standardized, we take that data and prepare it. We make it available to all kinds of downstream applications. These are all the data targets we talked about. So electronic lab notebooks, data warehouses, databases, line of business applications, you name it. Um, we power the data flow into all of these different targets. So in a nutshell, that's what Tetra Science does, right? Connectors, the lake, pipelines, APIs, targets. So this is still pretty abstract, and I'd love to walk you through what this looks like concretely on the ground at one of our implementations. So, well, let's stare at that for a moment. That's a lot of icons. It's a lot of different things going on. And uh, I think if I, if I tried to walk you through everything that's happening on that page, we'd still be here an hour from now. So uh, just to keep the discussion really focused, uh, let's follow the journey of one piece of data as it travels from left to right across the system. Uh, we start by ingesting uh, some chromatography data and we follow it as it gets centralized, harmonized, and eventually sent to a, uh, to a lab notebook downstairs. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, all the way on the right. So uh, strap in, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's see how that data travels. So uh, the first step, as I mentioned, is the connector. Uh, in this case, we're talking about a, an, an HPLC uh, or, a lit, or a chromatography system. And chromatography systems are, are widely, extensively really used across pharma and biopharma. Uh, so these are among the first set of instruments that we chose to integrate with. And, and the way we think about this as a company is we, we pursue deep lasting relationships with uh, the companies that produce these instruments, that produce the software systems that control uh, uh, the instruments and their data. So in this case, Waters, who is uh, one of the biggest vendors of, of uh, chromato chromatography systems, is actually one of our investors. We have a long relationship with them. They provide uh, SDKs to access the data produced by the, by the, by the chromatography systems. And uh, you know, uh, to many folks in the audience, if you're building on AWS, you're probably very used to, to running systems uh, Linux-based systems in the cloud. And that's a lot of what we do. But uh, the instrument landscape is different. Instruments tend to have control software written in .NET or on Windows. Um, with, with, these are very mature pieces of software that have existed since the 90s. And uh, we've built up a lot of expertise in the, in the nooks and crannies of these different pieces of software. Uh, in addition to getting the core information that the software provides, which is, you know, what are the actual physical numbers that were measured for this injection or this sample? We're also able to extract additional metadata such as logs and errors produced by the device while processing the sample. So you might want to know, hey, why is my chromatography system degrading over time? Oh, it turns out there's a firmware problem that's emitting extra logs. You want to know that. And uh, just thinking going beyond the basic functionality of these, of these data extractors, these connectors, uh, we also want to make sure that when we install these connectors onto a lab workstation, we're not getting in the way of the scientists' ability to get their work done. These lab workstations aren't single purpose devices like servers in the cloud. They, they exist to be used for a variety of ad hoc reasons by scientists. We want to be very respectful of what they're doing. We want to meet the scientists where they are. Now, uh, I've focused here heavily on the approach where we install an agent onto a computer connected to an instrument, but there's a, a whole other path where we use IoT approaches, where we, uh, we put a physical Tetra Science device connected to a port on the instrument and extract data that way. We won't talk more about that, but just something to keep in mind. So we've taken that data from the instrument. It's been turned into a big, messy blob of binary information and we're ready to put it into the cloud. Fantastic. We will centralize your data. We will, we will put it into the Tetra Science data lake. 
powered by S3, everyone's favorite data lake technology. And, uh, and, and, and now is when we're able to start really doing a lot more with this data. So the very first thing we do once we've got the data written down is to figure out how can we make this data really accessible to a lot of different tools. Currently, it's locked away in some binary format. The schema is poorly understood. How can we make it more accessible? And we reached for what is probably the, the preeminent data format of our times, which is JSON. And we figured out a set of strongly typed JSON schemas representing different categories of scientific data. We tried to design these schemas so that they capture the essence of what is going on with an instrument category or a type of scientific data without being tied to each vendor. So uh, if you take a Waters HPLC's readouts, convert them into our HPLC IDS, you can now compare those results across different HPLC vendors. You can understand, you can begin to ask questions like, which vendors columns degrade faster or slower? How do these, how do these experiments, how do these experimental results reproduce across different sites, right? All of these, um, cross cohort analyses that are much harder to do when you're siloed by vendor. And finally, given the data, given the JSON formatted data that we've extracted from these uh, vendor specific binary blobs, we're able to power a variety of cloud native solutions that give you deeper insight into that data. So we're able to give you Elasticsearch for search, Athena for SQL queries, powered by that same intermediate data schema that we talked about. So all of this, once you get your data into the cloud, without any additional work uh, on the scientist's part. I wanna move on from there onto the next stage in the process, which is our data pipelines. We talked about how the data got transformed into a standard, widely accessible format. And now starting from here, we're able to get that data and push it to a variety of targets. Uh, these can be on-premises or cloud-based targets, ELNs, uh, and, and we're going to focus on ELNs in this specific uh, uh, example. Typically, ELNs have REST APIs. Uh, each ELN may have a totally different REST API, but because we're starting from JSON, it's trivially easy to adapt the input format into whatever specific REST format the ELN requires. One of the most compelling use cases of doing this is that we're able to link back an ELN's slice of the data to the full rich data set that's now preserved in the cloud. Uh, one, of the, one of the popular ELNs we work with has a 25 megabyte limit on data sets that can be attached to an ELN result. Uh, whereas uh, mass spec data or flow cytometry data can easily go up into the gigabytes or even terabytes. So being able to link back to that from, an, from a visualization or a scientist's notes uh, can be invaluable in an audit setting or when you're trying to investigate deeply, more deeply into results. Uh, so hopefully I was able to give you some picture of, of what it is that we're able to do with uh, when we create this network linking together all these nodes with Tetris Science. Uh, uh, and and to, to recap, right? First piece, connectors. This represents the investment we've made into understanding different data sources. We understand how to write Windows software, how to build deep relationships with vendors, and how to bring in third-party collaborators like CROs. Uh, the second piece of, uh, of our approach is really creating this network, positioning ourselves in the market as a sort of neutral but heavily armed Switzerland, if you will, that really only cares about the data. We're not trying to control the end user experience. We're not trying to brand how the scientist gets their hands on the data. We want to make sure that everyone can come together and exchange data at, with the lowest possible friction, right? The third piece uh, in our approach is the intermediate data schema. And, and this is really the technical foundation of the network. It's, uh, uh, it's something that we put a ton of effort into. Our scientists, engineers, think deeply about how to represent different categories of scientific data, but still keep it JSON, keep it really widely accessible to data scientists uh, and, and, to, and to existing tools. Which finally brings me to the last piece, which is open standards. The reason that we use JSON, the reason that we use 
uh, these well-defined formats is to meet data scientists where they are, to meet your IT where they are, and make it possible for them to leverage Python, R, uh, Pandas, all of the existing systems that they're used to without needing to relearn and retool to take advantage of this data. Another way to slice how we're doing this, right, uh, is to ask why AWS, right? Um, the ideas that I spoke about on the previous slide, they're, they're fairly generic. They, translate, they, they transcend any implementation strategy, but we have really found AWS to be the perfect foundation on which to build this product and this platform. Uh, first of all, uh, AWS has hands down the best integration with enterprise IT and networking. Uh, the pharma company, the huge pharma companies that we're going after, they have uh, just massive IT investment. They're looking for a mature cloud partner who can who can anticipate and work with them at every stage of the transition. Uh, once we're in the cloud, AWS provides the most mature cloud native service offerings. So by taking advantage of these service offerings, we're able to create a lot of flexibility. We're able to minimize cost and we're able to get to market as fast as possible. We don't have to build a lot of the infrastructure for, these, uh, for this work uh, ourselves. We can focus on understanding scientific data formats. And uh, the, the end result of this for us has been, we're all in on AWS. We don't use uh, any kind of intermediary layer. Uh, we're not hedging our bets on cloud versus, uh, versus on-premises. We really try to make full, take full advantage of AWS's offerings, and we found it to be a tremendous accelerant in delivering our product. So, uh, with that, over to you, Rachel. I'd love to hear more about how this has been, how this has been working in the market. Thank you, Punya, for sharing some of the uh, magic behind the scenes. Um, I'm in marketing, so I get to think of it all as magic. Uh, so, we wanted to close out today by talking about a real world use case of our platform with uh, a couple of innovators who we are working closely with at Biogen who wanted to apply data automation and standards to their cell counter files. Um, so, you know, uh, Len Blackwell and George Vandendrusi came to us, or I'm gonna pretend they came to us because I'm not entirely sure how the uh, opportunity came about. Uh, but they had a situation in their uh, bio processing, bio manufacturing um, facility where they're using cell counters to figure out how to optimize their protein production. Um, and they discovered that this process was entirely manual and uh, just took far too much time and introduced far too much error into the entire process. And they were tasked with fixing this problem. Um, so let me talk you through the situation. So they have these five cell counters. Each cell counter has a local on-premises PC that captures the data. Uh, the way that the cell counter works, my understanding of it, is that it runs one sample, each cell counter runs one sample per day, and the running of the sample involves taking 50 images over the 24-hour period. And then at the end of the 24-hour period, the cell counter uh, compares all of these different images, takes different messages, and runs a bunch of calculations on those images. Now, the scientists need two or maybe three of those data points immediately uh, that they want to transfer to their ELN, their electronic lab notebook, so that they can do their analyses and get ready to run the next set of experiments. Every six months, the informatics team or the R&D IT team would then go to those on-premise PCs and manually transfer the full six months worth of data over to their data archive. Um, so that full amount of data is for each one of those samples. So five cell counters times one sample per day times 50 images and one text.txt file for each sample. So this is a lot of data in a bunch of different formats. Uh, and it, it made it really challenging to find anything. Um, once the data went into the ELN or into the data archive, it was almost impossible to get it back out. 
Now the picture on your screen doesn't even really do it justice in my opinion. It's really more like this because the process was so manual. Those point to point integrations didn't even exist. So, you know, I, I loved how Len characterizes this problem. Um, the lab of the future is built on data, agreed. Uh, their cell counter data was basically inaccessible. Uh, the heterogeneous nature of the information made it difficult to analyze without significant manual manipulation. So he tasked his team with um, making this data accessible and actionable for the data scientists and data scientists. So the specific data integrity risks that they identified were the presence of multiple file types, so both image files and text files, the volume of data, so the 51 files generated for each sample multiplied by the number of days and the number of instruments. The fact that the files were stored separately um, was a big issue. Each of those 50 images plus the text file all stored separately. Um, and just the manual manipulation required to go through this entire process. So what that all rolls up to is the fact that the data just wasn't accessible. Um, if their data scientists wanted to do more uh, secondary analysis and cross-cutting analysis across experiments or runs or some time period, it was almost impossible for them to do that. So the goals for the project that we worked on with them were to eliminate these data integrity risks and better align with FAIR principles. So making the data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So our charge was simple, automate and standardize. So what did we do? Uh, we did exactly what Punya described uh, using our platform is set up to do. So we had a connector that connected directly with these cell counters. Um, so we were able to automatically grab the data from the cell counter pretty much as soon as the sample was run, uh, put it into the data lake on AWS, run the pipelines to harmonize the data, and then we were able to move the required data points in the required format to the different data targets. So as I said before, just those two or three data points that the scientists needed were able to be sent over to the ELN pretty much immediately. Uh, we were also able to work with George and Len and their team to automate the basic analysis that the scientists did within the ELN. So once the data arrives, uh, across sample runs over, I think their their experimental pyramid was period was you know a week or two. Uh, so th the curve that they needed to look at to really evaluate the results was automatically showed up in their ELN. So not only did they not have to manually transfer the data, they didn't manually have to complete this routine analysis either. Then the full data. Um, in this case, anyone who's who's very familiar with the R&D R&D lab space uh, may have heard of the Allotrope Foundation and the Allotrope Data Format. So, uh, Lord, Len and George wanted the full data in the data archive to be transformed into this ADF Allotrope Data Format Allotrope Data File Format uh, for the long-term storage in the data archive. So we were able to use another data pipeline to transform the data and package up all 50 images plus the text file into a single data file that could then be placed into the data archive. Now what this opened up was the ability to do data science um, and advanced analytics that folks at Biogen had not been able to do before. So now that the data scientists could use the software that they are already familiar with, um, and they're able to go find the files that they were looking to find with a simple query, import the, the files, and they had all of the images and all of the information from the various sample runs in their software, and they were able to do some advanced analytics that they were unable to do before, which led to some interesting conclusions. And I have a, a link, hopefully these slides will be made available, um, or you can come to the Tetra Science website on our blog and on our YouTube page, and there is a blog post and a couple of videos that go deeper into this use case um, and, and talk about what this, uh, these analytics that they unlocked were, as, as, along with the demo of how it works. 
So I also love this quote from Len about how the project ended up, or at least this first phase of the project ended up. He talks about these two really important improvements that came out of the process. First, analysis is fully automated, uh, which they were just, you know, made a huge difference in the scientist's day. And second, the fact that data integrity is improved by aggregating the multiple, pi multiple files from each sample into a single file. Plus, the storage of the data in the archive was automated. So these are key points that he wanted to make sure no one overlooked. Uh, so Len, we're not overlooking those points. So thank you again for spending the time with us today and to AWS for having us. We're so glad to be part of this event. Uh, contact information is included in this presentation, so please be, feel free to reach out. We would love to continue the conversation online or offline. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.